Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our study through the book of Revelation. Um, we're going to be covering three churches in this session. We're going to cover Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis. That's going to be Revelation 2, 12 through 3, 6. Just a reminder, grab the PDF PowerPoint of photos and more information than I usually get to <laughs> during the YouTube. So um, grab it and let's prepare our hearts to hear what the word of the Lord is for us. And not only our hearts, but our ears as well. For how often does Jesus say to him who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. So let's pray. Jesus, help. Help us to hear the word of the Lord. Help us to not just hear, but to do. Help us to apply these teachings to our lives. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, real quick, I don't think I covered this in the previous uh, lessons, but just a reminder that the way these churches are laid out in the order, in the exact order of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, we actually have a snapshot of the history of the church through the ages. So we've covered Ephesus and Smyrna, and that would be the apostolic age, Ephesus, um, kind of from John's uh, 100 and back, uh, date-wise. And then Smyrna was the age of persecution. And we talked about that letter being all about death. We've talked about the, the Caesars that, um, in a sense, implemented martyrdom, persecution. And uh, again, in the letter to the church at Smyrna, it said, you're going to have to endure this for 10 days. There were 10 Caesars that uh, basically killed Christians. Over 5 million were killed during this time. And that's what Smyrna in the letter to Smyrna is all about is be faithful to the end. And now we're gonna begin a shift because when we talk about Pergamos, we're gonna talk about Constantine. We're gonna talk about a mixed marriage. So when we get to Constantine in about three 13, 320 or whatever, we're going to deal with him coming on the scene saying no longer is Christianity punishable by death, but now it's the state religion. I'm going to marry Rome with Christendom. It ain't going to work. And uh, we're going to see the implications of that as we tackle Pergamos. And then that morphs into Thyatira, which is the rise of the papacy. And now we're going to deal with Roman Catholicism. And then we're going to, hopefully, by the end of this session, we're going to get to the Reformation. And that's going to be the Church of Sardis. And again, just pointing out, because they're in this order, we have the exact history of the church because from Sardis the Reformation will go into the the missionary aspect of the church in Philadelphia and uh, all these are in the days in which we're living now obviously as well as the last being the apostate church which is the church of Laodicea so let's fasten our seat belts let's jump in Pergamos one of the places that I absolutely love to see and walk. It's spectacular, the ruins that are there. And in slide number, well, the numbers are going to be different here, but check it out. You're going to see four or five different slides in that PDF that I talked to you about of Pergamos. One from way above looking down and you'll see... Uh, the altar of Zeus, you'll see the amphitheater. And uh, then as I make my way through, and we'll talk more about what was what is there, we'll see the ruins of uh, one of the temples, the temple of, uh, I think it's Athena. And then 
Jesus is going to say, this is where Satan's throne is. And there are a couple pictures of that. I find it interesting. And the one that you're going to find that basically says the throne of Satan. Uh, this picture is taken and it's they have reconstructed from the ruins the throne of Satan. And this is just gets crazy in Berlin. And it was taken and reconstructed in Berlin around 1930, the rise of the Nazis, of Adolf Hitler. And Hitler uh, basically wanted a platform to speak from. He gets an architect, his name was uh, Albert Speer, to design a platform in Nuremberg. Uh, and he wanted it to be exactly the same as the throne of Satan from Pergamos, which now is in Berlin. And you will see the different symbols upon the altar. The snakes, um, again, the serpents, it's where Satan dwells. So let's get into that text. And uh, we'll read in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Just as a reminder, the book of Revelation is divided into three parts, not equally, but three sections. John is told to write the things that he sees. That's chapter one. And in chapter one, all those idioms and we read here about a sharp two-edged sword, are going, we're gonna find those as breadcrumbs as he addresses the individual churches. John is writing of what he sees in the resurrected, glorified Christ, and that's chapter one. And then he's told to write the things that are, and that's where we're at today. The seven letters, to the seven churches, chapters two and three. And again, as we've said, these seven, no big surprise at seven, that number in the Hebrew for completion are letters that Jesus dictates to his church. And you can't circle one and say that I'm living there. We need to take them all and embrace what Jesus is saying to the church worldwide. Because I'm going to tell you, each day, parts of each day, you're going to be in one of these seven churches. And we need to have ears to hear what Jesus is saying to us. So that's right the things that are. It's the eternal present. And then chapters 4 through 22, which we'll cover once we get back from our journeys with Paul tour. He's told to write the things, and the Greek is, term is metatauta, which is write the things that take place after these things. And that's that after these things, metatauta, I believe that that's what's going to be, that's what's going to be taking place post-rapture. So we'll get into that, but those are the three areas. And so again, John is now digging back to chapter one as he's dictating this letter to Pergamos. Now that name Pergamos means mixed marriage. And so he's gonna be addressing a church that's compromised. And he says, these things says he who has that sharp two-edged sword. And by the way, that sword was not the Roman one. It was the, the, the word in the Greek has to do with the, the two-edged battle sword that a man would wear on his back that went from his neck all the way down to just about the ground. And it had the power of, in a sense, when it was strike a man, could take him right down the middle or whatever. So that's the image, not a little... Roman sword, but the huge one that was worn on the back. So the compromised church is now warned because it's married the Roman Empire. Now, Pergamos was the capital of the region at this time. But again, application for us, compromise. 
It's J.B. Phillips that writes in Romans chapter 12. He says, don't let this world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That squeezing into its mold has to do with being compromised to the culture. The people of Pergamos were uh, temple keepers. They were known as the temple keepers of Asia. The city had three great temples that were dedicated to the worship of the Roman Empire emperor, another for the goddess Athena, and the other was the great altar of Zeus. There was also Escapulius, the medical sort of, uh, you know, there was a health spa that was here. And interestingly enough, part of the treatments in this health spa was the room was filled with serpents and you would go in and sleep there overnight and pray that one of the serpents would slither over you as a means for healing. This is what's taking place here. And so Jesus then writes and says, I know your works. We've talked about that. And he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. That's for the second time. Now, now when you're in Pergamos, that altar of Zeus at the top of the mountain, a Satan's throne where Satan dwells could be seen 50 miles away. And again, it was known as the savior serpent as well because of what I talked about as far as that health spa. And then we get this um, figure, this personage of Antipas. He was reputed to be the bishop of the Christian church at Pergamos during the time of John. And under Nero's persecution, he was um, burned. He was put in a brazen, a bronze bull-shaped altar. It was heated up until it was just that orange-red glow. And he was put in the middle and it was closed in on him. And that's how he suffered martyrdom. And again, Jesus calls him out. He basically says he was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And then we come to Balaam. Verse 14, he says, but I got a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, the story of Balaam, for most people that hear that name, the, all they can think about is a, tonk, a talking donkey or whatever. It's unfortunate that that's what would come to mind because that's not really the emphasis of the whole account of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet for hire. Again, we're not sure of that relationship, but I am sure of this. You spelled prophet for Balaam, P-R-O-F-I-T, because he was hired by Balak to curse Israel. And no matter how hard he tried or how much he was given, every time he opened his mouth to curse Israel, only blessings came out. And so finally, Balak is so frustrated with him that he says, you know, what's the deal? I've given you so much resources and riches, and yet instead of cursing, you're always blessing. And Balaam says, I can't help it, but I'll tell you how to defeat Israel. And then he says, get your Moabite girls and send them to the encampment as the Israelite boys and let them mix together. And ultimately they'll say, come on, buddy, let me show you how we worship our God. 
And this is where sexual immorality takes place. And it is the downfall of Israel. So the doctrine of Balaam is twofold. It's whether it's the way of Balaam, the era of Balaam, and all of this is in your notes. It has to do with prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, and the warning against sexual immorality. And so it's interesting that as we look back, there might be some that would say, hey, you know, um, those back then do not have the same temptations that we have now. Don't kid yourself. Sexual immorality is one of the big three for Satan, right? He doesn't need to come up with four, five, and six. He's got three that work and they're tried and true. Money, profit, sex, immorality, and power. Those three are the downfall of many. And again, we're warned in scripture, especially against sexual immorality. And when we think about when, when the church was flourishing and Gentiles were coming into the kingdom, the big question is, well, what are we going to do with these Gentiles that are, are coming to know Jesus? And so the Jerusalem Council, is when the bigwigs all get together, they basically come up with this and they say they do not have to become Jews in order to receive Jesus. But let's counsel them to not be polluted by idols and that they need to flee sexual immorality. Again, knowing the destructive power of that. So in Pergamos, when I mention the temptations, you have to understand that the worship of Athena and different goddesses of both the Greek and Romans all had to do with prostitution. If you wanted to worship God, you it was not it was sanctioned that you would have intercourse with a temple prostitute. It was part of your act of worship. So that's what's taking place in that day. And in so doing, again, we find the destructive practice. It's the same thing that Balaam said to Balak, you want to destroy Israel? Send your girls in and let them seduce and let them introduce foreign gods exactly what takes place all right verse 15 thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans we talked about that last week we know that Jesus says in so many words no he says in these words I hate the works the deeds of the Nicolaitans Again, that has everything to do with access to the most holy. It's the rule of the clergy over the laity. And this is going to be the door that the papacy in Thyatira is going to open up. Where you no longer will have the word of God. You will have veil menders who's taken that curtain that was torn from top to bottom and mended it and basically said, common people, let me be your access to God. I'll tell you what the word of God says. Come to me for confession, veil menders. And so Jesus says, I hate that. I hate that work of the Nicolaitans. And then he says, repent or I also come to you quickly. I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And yes, this is that two-edged sword that we read in Hebrews that is living, powerful, and it can pierce even the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of thoughts and the intent of the heart. Remember, we talked about those two words, I know. 
Jesus knows. Well, overcomers, verse 17, here's what they get. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Interesting. Hidden manna, I think that refers to John 6, verses 32 to 35, where Jesus basically says, I'm manna. I am the living bread. It's me. I think the overcomers, Jesus has simply said, I'm going to give them myself, man. He is the bread of life. He is that manna which was given. And then it says, if you're an overcomer, you're going to get a white stone with a name written on it. Okay. Now, in that day, a white stone, it could be translated as a diamond, um, which it's a symbol of admittance, um, victory, uh, or it could be a, a in the judicial system when a final verdict was given, there was a black stone and a white stone. You can guess, not guilty, white stone given. And so that was what determined innocence. And so it was also a white stone or a diamond that was given to the victors of the games. Um, but here we're told that Jesus is going to give a, let's say it's a diamond, a white stone with a name, a new name written on it that no one knows except him who receives it. And I know, if you've heard me teach before, you probably know what's coming. Whenever I talk about the greatness of God, I always will say this, the macro is amazing, okay? I, I'm sitting here in my office looking out at the Spokane River trees. It is gorgeous. It's beautiful. From here, I see amazing sunsets. The tranquility of this place, it's creation shouting about the existence of God. And we can go on, whether it's the northern lights, whether it's the galaxies in the sky, you name it. The macro is amazing and shouts of the existence of God. But for me, it's the micro. The micro the fact that we just read that he knows my thoughts. He knows the intent of my heart. He created me. I am uniquely made and fashioned. No two the same. And then the chorus that I love. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that comes to my eyes. The intimacy of God with you. Not, the, not just the billions that were created, but with you. And his desire in creating you was for an intimate relationship. So when I put that all together, I think Jesus is actually going to give me a white stone with a name. And I have a feeling it's the name that he's chosen for me. And even though my name now is William Daniel Stolbarger, I have a feeling that when I get that diamond with a name on it, when I read that name, it will resonate to the core of my being and that is who I am. Just a thought. But pretty amazing when we see what is given to the overcomers and the names. I, I, you know, I said, what's in a name? And nicknames are powerful and God changes names. Abram, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, Jacob, heel grabber, swindler, Israel, Prince of God. Simon, you're no longer gonna be called Simon. You are the rock, you are Peter. 
Interesting. That's what's going to happen when we see him face to face. All right, now we'll move on to the second church in this study this evening, Thyatira. And these pictures there, I have to let you know, I have been to all seven of these churches. And um, in a couple weeks, we're going to the first three, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos. And then we're moving on to Macedonia and doing Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, and uh, Athens or whatever, but these seven churches all in Western Turkey, um, some of them are spectacular to see the ruins today and some not so much. And I have to be honest with you, when we were in Thyatira, I was not impressed with the ruins. This is what you're going to see here. The ruins that are left in Thyatira, you can see it's almost just a, a city block in the midst of the city. And so take your time and go through these and you'll see what Thyatira looks like today. Now, interesting that as we go through this letter, again, we went from a mixed marriage in Constantine into the rise of the, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. And so to the angel of the church in Thyatira, which means continued sacrifices, it's the introduction of the mass. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, these things says the son of God. And by the way, it's the only time in this book that Jesus calls himself or uses that title. These things says the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Those are those images back to chapter one. Flame of fire, he sees, he knows, he searches the hearts and mind. Fine brass always is judgment. This city was famous for dying and was the center of the purple or the indigo trade. Its uh, trade guilds were the, were the biggest one of all those guilds were, was uh, the dyeing of fabrics. And we read about someone as the first believer of Paul's missionary journey in Philippi, where he's going to lead Lydia. And it says that Lydia was a seller of purple and she was from here, Thyatira. Okay, so this is the atmosphere of what's taking place. But know this, even though it is the most insignificant, smallest place, this letter is the longest that's given to this church. This is going to be the church of the dark ages. And I always ask the question, what made the dark ages dark? And what was the light of the enlightenment or the renaissance? Or in so many words, what brought the end to the dark ages? The dark ages are dark because the word of God, because the work of the Nicolaitans, came to the forefront. The word of God was taken from everyday people and put in the hands of the clergy. We have the rise of the priesthood. We have the clergy over the laity. Dark ages. No word, no relationship. Renaissance, enlightenment, reformation, Gutenberg press, when the, hand, when the word of God was given back into the hands of everyday people. So that's what's transpiring. We're now going to go up to our necks in Catholicism here and to what's transpired. And it's still around today. Let me say this. I know many of the Catholics, brothers and sisters that are believers. I have no doubt. They love Jesus, they follow Jesus. But I also know many that the Roman Catholic faith is no faith at all, it's a religion. 
And many go through different rituals, and I fear that they do not know Jesus. But yes, I believe that there are those Catholics that are born again and love Jesus. So let me get that out of the way as we move in. So verse 19 says, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. In many ways, this is an amazing compliment to Thyatira. He says, you know what? You're doing better now than you were before. It's sort of the opposite of Ephesus, right? You need to get back to what you were doing. I'm going to remove your lampstand. But then notice he singles out these four amazing essential qualities. They had love, both for the Lord and for one another. They knew service. They had faith. And He points out patience also. That ain't bad. I wouldn't mind that being said about me. But then he goes on, and of course, we get the nevertheless. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrifice to idols. Jezebel, you know, I, I, I was sharing last night, there are some names that are never uh, considered in this day and age of naming children and babies, right? I mean, there's not too many nurseries that you can go into and say, uh, where's baby Judas, right? Or where's it? Do we have little uh, Jezebel here? Where is she? Sort of thing. No. Jezebel, the quintessential villain, took Israel to its lowest point. A self-proclaimed prophetess and in a sense, caused Israel to fall to its lowest ebb. As you know, married to Ahab, we know the story of the prophets of Baal. We know the story of Naboth's vineyard, which is really symbolic of the Inquisition. It all points back to Jezebel. And... uh, you can read all the notes about it that I li- have listed about her and what she's done. But make no mistake, Elijah, at the top of his game, right? Prophets of Baal, fire coming down from heaven, consuming, taking the prophets of Baal down to the river Kishon and uh, lopping off their heads or whatever. Then he's given word in the midst of this tremendous victory that Jezebel's a bit upset. And what does our man Elijah do? Saying, you think I bring her on? No, when he hears this, he turns tail and runs out of fear. Jezebel. And the church of Thyatira, it, you, you have to understand that Jesus' complaint against them is not that they embrace Jezebel or her works, but they tolerate them. Now, when we're into this mixed marriage and when we're into this period of time within our culture, the question is today, what do we take a stand against And what are we tolerating? Well, sexual immorality, gender confusion. (laughs) Are we tolerating? So Jesus goes on to say in verse 21, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, 
I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give each one of you according to your works. So there's no or else. There's not nevertheless, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this. No, the sentence is given. The church system, this church system is still in existence today and will be until his return. As I mentioned, the problem is not that they embraced Jezebel, they tolerated her and her teachings. So again, the sentence is that if you don't repent, I'll throw you into the great tribulation. Only the unrepentant go into that. And then I search the minds and hearts once again, referring back to that all-knowingness of God, that two-edged sword. And then he says in verse 24, Now I say to you and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I'll put no other burden on you, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations." So these depths of Satan. Okay, let me just get this out of the way. Rites, ceremonies, titles, vestments, celibate priesthood, the worship of Mary, icons and images, crucifixes, veneration of saints, adoration of the host, papal infallibility, transubstantiation, purgatory, indulgences, confession, all idolatrous, thinly veneered with Christianity nomenclature. The depths of Satan. And then he says, but to those that are not, you, you've kept yourself from these. Um, you hold fast, you're faithful. Then he says, he shall give them, he shall rule them, <coughs> excuse me, with a rod, rod of iron, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel as I have received from my father and I will give them the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what he says to the churches. The, the rod of iron. We have the shepherd's staff and we have the rod of iron. A shepherd's staff was used to guide his sheep. The rod of iron was used to protect his sheep. You can't just tolerate you have to take a stand and to protect the sheep, sometimes what's needed is a rod of iron. And then the bright and morning star. This is the star that makes itself visible right before the sun rises. And no matter how dark it may be, the bright and morning star is Jesus. And in the midst of extreme darkness, which I think we're entering in, never forget the bright and morning star. He is in control. All right, time to move on. Last church of the day. And it's important that you see these photos because the story of Sardis has to do with the photos that you're going to see here. And it's not the ruins but it's the mountains or the hills in the background that I want you to see, okay? So you're seeing the ruins today as they are, but note 
that mountain in the background as you make your way through these slides. And the reason I want you to note that is because historically, Sardis thought itself to be impregnable and they didn't be cut. Let me just read an account of the fall of Sardis to you. It was situated on a hill a thousand feet above a broad valley at the base of Mount Tumas. It appears to be impregnable. However, there was the, the sheer precipice cliffs were clay and they suffered erosion from time to time and cracking and these all made what looked to be um, in, in a sense impregnable it, it they created occasional cracks that could be exploited but there was a false confidence that was reflected in the inhabitants of Sardis. And again, the phrase that was used about them is that they had an appearance without reality, a promise without performance, outward appearance of strength, but was betrayed by a lack of vigilance. So in 549 BC, and again in 214 BC, both the Persians as well as the Greeks destroyed Sardis because they were not watchful and they believed that these cliffs would keep them safe. And in both of these accounts, the enemies of Sardis watched and they noticed things. And because the Sardinians were not watchful, they were defeated. So keep that in mind, kind of that brief history of that. And then this note, because if the Church of Thyatira represented the papacy and the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, keep in mind, we read there that there were overcomers. This church here, which we all have roots in, if you're a Protestant, if you're an evangelical, you have roots in Sardis, okay? Because this is the Church of the Reformation. <clears throat> so keep that in mind as we're reading. If you thought I was hard on Catholicism, uh, wait until you hear what Jesus has to say about the Reformation. <clears throat> and to the angel of the Church of Sardis, right? These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, back to chapter one for an explanation. I know your works and then listen, that you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. This is one of two churches, the other Laodicea, that have no attaboys, no commendations. Sardis, the name means remnant, but it was not watchful. He says, you have a name. In the Greek, you can substitute that for a label. You have a label. A label that you are alive, but you're not. You're dead. You only have a name. You have no testimony. You only have a name. You have a label. This is denominationalism, right? That once the enthusiasm has passed and now it's just replaced by cold formalism. The church aid, Protestant, Reformation. To me, this is the saddest of all the letters because even though they had a name, there was nothing behind it. Historically, as well as spiritually, Sardis didn't know when the enemy was coming. <clears throat> In 
in the next slide, it simply says a name versus a testimony. And there is a famous black pastor that gave this sermon and I can't duplicate the way he was able to articulate this. But boy, after listening to it, you realize the difference between a name and a testimony. He said, you know, Cain had a name, but it was Abel that had the testimony. Pharaoh, the greatness of Pharaoh, oh, he had the name. But the testimony belonged to Moses. Haman, Haman, all bow when Haman's chariot goes by, but no, he had the name, but it was Mordecai that has the testimony. Saul, King Saul had the name, but it's David with the testimony. Nero, during the time of those great persecutions, feared and had a name, but Paul wouldn't bend a knee because he had the testimony. Pilate, Pilate, name, Jesus, testimony. You know, a label and names aren't going to cut it. Testimony. Personal testimony. Your own experience with God. It's practical. It's the proclamation of what Jesus did for me. It's sharing your life and with others of how God intersected it. Later in Revelation, we're going to read about what defeats the devil. It says he's defeated by the blood of the lamb. Ain't nothing else added to that. We are justified by his works and his works alone. But it says Satan will be defeated by the blood of the land and by the word of their testimony. You have a testimony. Give it, share it, live it. You don't want just a name. <clears throat> Verse two, be watchful. Remember, they weren't historically, and so his words, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I've not found your works perfect before God yet. Be watchful, be vigilant. You know, as we think about this and as we think about the book of Revelation, you know, when we think about end times prophecy, I'm often asked, you know, what are your thoughts about this or that? And what are the details about wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and all that sort of stuff? It's interesting when the disciples came to Jesus and said, tell us all these things. Basically, he's going to reduce it down to a couple of things. He's going to say, you need to be watchful not be deceived, you need to pray. And so I think it's fair to elevate the need for prayer in the times in which we're living. But when we ask the question, okay, 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 what should I be watching for? And this is, a, this is where we're going to get into the rest of this book. And I think some of the things that I'm going to list here are seeds that are growing in our day. What should we watch for? The rise of lawlessness in our day. The rise of a global government, a global religion, a global government that can shut down the world because of a pandemic, a global religion that seeks to take the absolute truths out of the way and make it all subjective and find a middle ground for the monotheistic religions of, of Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity. Let's just all get along. Israel, what should we be watching for? Israel. It's where he's going to return. 
We're, we know that once the rapture of the church place takes place, God reinvests himself in Israel. 144,000, 12,000 from each tribes. Israel. Ezekiel 38 and 39, Israel. The Battle of Armageddon, Israel. We should be watching for the hearts of many growing cold. When culture takes over the church, when the church no longer takes a stand but tolerates what the Bible teaches against. Anyhow, some things to think about. You're not finished yet. Strengthen the things that remained. Be watchful. <clears throat> and then we're told in verse three, remember, and, and, and I know I'm running out of time here. I tried to keep all of these under 60 minutes, but that word remember is so important. Remember, therefore, how you've received and heard and hold fast and repent. And therefore, if you will not watch, I'm going to come upon you like a thief and you'll not know the hour in which I come upon you. Three things there. Remember, hold fast and repent, and you better watch, okay? Remembering. How often in the scriptures do we read that the Israelites forgot the Lord their God? And Moses says, it's going to happen. You're going to come into the land and somehow over the years, you're going to believe that you actually did this and you're going to forget the Lord. And he's going to say to them, when that happens, exile. And the only way out of exile is that one word. Remember. Remember who he is and what he's done. It's the first step of rescue. It's the first step of redemption and restoration is to remember. Fred, uh, Frederick Beekner wrote a book. Don't remember most of it, but the title and a concept remains in my mind. The book's called A Room Called Remember. And he says, as a believer, you need to carve out a room in your mind and furnish it with godly memories because your enemy, Satan, is a thief or murderer from the very beginning and he desires to steal all of your godly memories. So create a room, decorate it with remembering how God delivered, saved, did amazing things in your life because that thief will come to steal them. That leads to exile. And deliverance comes when we remember. And so then again, hold fast, repent, and watch. And uh, then he says in verse four, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who's not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And there's always a remnant. And uh, the kingdom's upside down. And so, you know, when, when the numbers are too strong, God says, no, nah, I'm not going to think about Gideon. You got too many people. If, if you go to battle against the Midianites with this group, you're going to believe you did it. So let's, let's get the odds in my favor. And in odds in God's favor is to whittle it down to 300. Now, what seems impossible, you'll know it's because of my hand. A remnant. In this day and age, we can be gloom and doom and the sky is falling, but God has a remnant. He had a remnant with Noah, with Moses, with the 7,000 that didn't bend a knee to Baal during the time of Elijah. David's mighty men, a remnant. Nehemiah, Gideon, Mordecai. I could go on. I gave you a list. But there is a remnant. And through that remnant, God will be victorious. And then he ends by saying, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. 
and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There are some things in Scripture that the Holy Spirit puts in or allows to be there to make us uncomfortable. I think this is one of them. Because the concept of blotting out is a bit concerning to me. You've heard the phrase, once saved, always saved, right? But what does this mean? He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I won't blot his name out. That kind of infers that if you don't overcome, your name might be blotted out, right? There's that godly tension. And then again, the statement. And as much as that we all want, when we see Jesus face to face, we all want to hear, well done, right? But Notice, your name's in the book of life, and Jesus says, I'll confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Sounds good, doesn't it? But you know, the other side of that coin, Jesus says, if you forsake me, if you are not willing to confess me before others, I will not confess you before my Father. So again, tension, all intended to keep us watchful with a first love, with a zeal and passion to share our testimony in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so those are the three churches for today, for tonight. Whenever you're watching this, the church of Pergamos, a mixed marriage that grows into the dark ages of Thyatira, emerges in the Reformation under Sardis, but warns those, don't be content with just a name. So that's it for this week. I hope you join us again next week as we uh, finish the last two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea. And if you're watching this and uh, you're a member of our Old Fashioned Bible Study, we're also going to uh, next week, it'll be part of the 10 days of Ah Rosh Hashanah is on Friday at sunset. And so as we make our way through those 10 days that lead up to Yom Kippur, we'll talk a little bit about the meaning of Rosh Hashanah and why as believers, it might be something that we would be wise to integrate into our lives. So with that, God bless you and Shalom.